uh, a little bit uh, later. So let's get that out of there. All righty. So visualization. So we covered some of the basic plots yes, uh, yesterday. So we talked about hist, bar plot, or box plot, plot in, in general. And we talked about some ways to change those graphics around. Um, we're going to expand that, and we're going to talk about ggplot2 uh, in particular. Uh, we are going to talk about some base plots, and actually towards the end, the very end of this lecture, there are other examples of how to do things in base R, but we've kind of scrapped most of that completely and went to ggplot2, which is again another hadley Wickham package, which is again, hopefully, a more intuitive way to do plots. Um, the one thing I will say about it, it will give you nice ish looking plots by default, that again does not mean they are good enough for publication, they are good enough for final plots. You still have to customize, you still have to customize, you still have to customize. Because I've graded homeworks, I've graded, I've looked at papers, and I can tell when someone uses defaults and didn't take more than five minutes on a plot, their labels aren't big, their labels aren't good, their, their legends are all over the place, and we'll try to make them a little bit better. So okay, we'll be using some of the um, so, in a very optimistic way, we're using a death data set, right? Uh, so, and we'll read it in and call it death. Um, and so, this is actually uh, mortality for children over a certain number of years, over a certain set of countries, actually a lot of countries. So, we're going to read it in using read R again. We're going to use read underscore CSV. And you'll see the output at the top here. And so, actually, it's a bunch of... Uh, uh, child mortality data from 1760 all the way out to the projections of 2100. So it actually goes past uh, now and goes in the future. And the first column, if you actually read it, uh, opened it up in Excel, the first column is the countries, but it doesn't have a header name at all. So what it, um, if you read this in, it'll tell you it gave you like a little bit of a warning saying the first column didn't have anything in there. I'm going to call it X1. And you see all the other ones are the years that we're talking about. And they are with this back tick notation because, again, R is not a super big fan of having column names that start with numbers. So they have to be escaped in a certain way. So R knows that you're talking about a column name versus a number when you're actually using it in code. So we're going to do, so we could have renamed, use the rename command in dplyr, but right here, just for simplicity, I always know the first column is going to be country. I just say set the first column name to be country, and we see at the bottom that it's been reset so that we can actually reference it by country and not x1. So okay, we're gonna do a very basic plot. This is one of the plots we'll do in base R. So uh, I'm actually gonna bring in the dplyr package so I can use the pipe, the filter, and the select commands again. So I'm gonna take uh, the death data set, I'm gonna pipe it in. So again, we are gonna take the death, death data set, push it forward into the filter function. I want the country of Sweden. I'm gonna push that filter data set into the select function, and I'm gonna drop the country. Right? I know this row of data is all about Sweden. Right, so I don't need that country anymore. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a year, and I'm going to make a vector of it, and I'm, I'm going to set it to be the years uh, of the, co uh, sorry, the column names are all the years, and I'm just going to make a numeric vector that goes from 1760 to 2100 and, and get that as an object. And then what I'm going to do here is plot the Sweden death data by year. The reason I made... Uh, the as.numeric call there is because when you actually do this subsetting and selecting, it'll give you just a row of, number, of numbers back for Sweden, but it's still actually in a data frame or actually in a tibble. So we want to just say, no, I know they're just numbers. I want you to just make that into a vector. So just as.numeric on that, and we're using the formula syntax again. So it's as.numeric, this numerical vector Sweden of all the death data plotted by year. So y tilde x, again, is the format for this formula notation. We could have similarly said plot year comma as that numeric Sweden, which is a different way of specifying it. But this, I'm going to use the formula syntax because it's a little bit more clear when we start using data sets a little bit later. So now we see this lovely scatter plot. Again, base r by default is ugly, kind of intentionally, but it gives you the gist of it. So if you're doing some sort of exploratory data, it looks like you know, child mortality was really high. It went down, and actually Sweden has some of the lowest uh, child mortality in the world. So, and it's projected to be slightly even lower in 2100. So, we are going to go over the base uh, parameters a little bit here. Um, again, we're not going to use them that extensively, but you should know, uh, for the most part, what they do. So, in the base R command, PCH means the point shape. 
right? So what are you plotting? You're plotting circles, you're plotting squares, you're plotting circles that are filled in, you're plotting squares that are filled in, are you plotting stars that are filled in or stars that are empty? Um, CEX or sex is the size of the scale. So how much do you want to scale, uh, for example, the text of the, of the point? How, how big do you want to scale the points up? How big do you want to scale, for example, the text? So usually there are other parameters like sex saying, how big do you want the points? Text.sex, which corresponds to how big do you want the text? So that, if it's one, it's saying I want them to be the default size. If it's greater than one, I want them bigger. If it's less than one, I want them smaller. So YLab and XLab, so these are all arguments that you put in the plot function, by the way. So XLab corresponds to the X label, not the labels for the ticks. It is the title for the X axis. Y lab similarly for the Y axis. Main in the plot function is the plot title, the thing you see at the top. So if we go back here, by default, there's nothing there. By default, the X uh, label is the variable name that you put there. So is Y, but sometimes that can be really ugly. And you can also see by default, the X axis, you can read left to right, but the Y axis is actually tilted 90 degrees. So um, it plots in that direction. So uh, ggplot does a little bit different of defaults, and we'll talk about that. LWD, line width, or line density. How thick do you want a line? If you're plotting lines, how thick do you want them? So these are specific to the type of plot you're doing. If you're doing point plots, PCH matters. If you're doing line plot, it doesn't. If you're doing a line plot, LWD, line width matters. If you're doing points, it doesn't. How? Just the color. Red, green, blue, or you can specify it in hexadecimal, Right with you know if you go online and say this color is it's like uh, so for example hexadecimal red color so there are other ways to specify colors so if you went to a color palette and you're like I love this color this is my favorite color in the world and it gives you just this it doesn't actually have a default in R it's not like red pinkish brick, right? There's no, like, R doesn't understand that. If you want to copy this, you can specify that as a color. Again, sex, axis, lab, main. So if you want to scale the text of certain things, the labels or the title. So here's an example. We're going to change up the X label or the Y label. We're going to change up the main title and we're going to say we don't want points anymore. We want lines. So type will, so if you use plot by default, most times it will do points. Uh, if you want to switch that up, you say type equals L. I want to do a line plot. So this will be a little bit more explicit when we talk about ggplot2. Uh, but for the most part, this is what you see. Again, we change the title, we change the axis, and everything looks the same, except it's lines. So now, similarly, uh, there is an X lim. So what are, what are the limits of X that you actually want to plot? So I don't really care about data after 2012. Right, that's projections in that. Maybe that's projections in the future. We could have done tw uh, 2016. Um, I want to change the style of the points. I want them to be filled in blobs. Um, I want them to be 20% bigger, and I want them to be blue. Okay, I like blue. Okay. Is anything unclear about this plot? What we're getting here? All right, great. So um, again, there is also a subset argument, right, in the plot function. So the only difference between here and the last slide is the subset argument was used rather than xlim. Right? So xlim, we explicitly said the limits of x that we were going to plot. Here we're saying if year is less than 2015. Now note, when base r is doing stuff, it is not smart in the same way dplyr is. When it's talking about, when you do dplyr functions, it knows when you put year, it means this is a column of this data set. Right? when you're doing select or filter and all that kind of stuff. In base R, it doesn't know that. Year is just a vector that is in my memory. So these could be totally, as long as they were the same length, R wouldn't care, but these could be totally different things that you're subsetting on, right? So like, for example, you could have said, you know, uh, where Sweden, the years where Sweden, for example, had an infant mortality below five, as long as this is the same length, that's a logical vector, it says, I'm only going to subset this data out to do it. Okay, so subset takes in a logical vector or the indices that you want to plot. Now, um, the one thing about that is, uh, so the one thing about uh, uh, 
ggplot2, for the most part, it really likes your data to be long, right? So this tidying, data wrangling ideology is, is very consistent across. So pretty much, if you have a column that you, uh, a variable that you want to plot, it better be in one of the columns of your data set. It shouldn't be this huge matrix, matrix like some of the other data we've shown you. So what we're going to do is we're going to take tidy off, right? If we want to plot stuff across time, we have to make time a column, right? We need the years as a column. We need the data associated with it in another column. Right now, it's not that. The columns are actually data, but we care about the column names. We care about those actual years, so we have to reshape it. So again, we've just gone over gather. So we're going to pull in the tidyr package. We can use gather. We're going to pull in the death data set. We're going to say the key, the thing we want to create. We're going to call that year, the value. What do we want to call that column? Deaths. Okay? And so we could have said, and then it's going to ask, which columns do you want to gather up? And in this case, I want to gather everything except country. I could have written, you know, 1760, 1761, 1762, all the way up to 2100. Those are the columns I want to gather up and turn into data, but it's much easier to just say not country. So sometimes it's easier to specify the columns you do want to gather, right? In the case of the um, in the case of the circulator data, we we said it had to start with orange, had to start with purple, for example. Um, but in this case, we said everything but this. Okay. Country is in there, so country will remain in the data set after it's gathered, but it says don't convert this into a date. Don't convert this. Don't. So you can think of it again in some respects from going wide to long, so it's saying take this data, string it out, and make it longer, and make them variables. What would happen if you had the variables? Let's find out. So, right, death is this data set. I'm going to gather it together. So let's table long year. So, it'll just say, okay, you want this as data? I'm okay with that. So, one of those rows, or 197 of those rows say country, and the values of those, um, so head, long, long year equals country, right? But these are words, everything else is numbers, so this column is going to be what? Character. So it actually just put them all together, even though that doesn't make sense, that these rows are actual countries, the next rows are, are words, or sorry, these rows are these rows are country that are words, the ret next are all actual numbers that would correspond to infant mortality or child mortality. It'll put it together but it actually will do some conversion that you don't want to happen. So that's why we want to say, make sure you don't gather this one up. And so similarly with the um, Charm City Circulator data set, we didn't want another column, we didn't want a row that says like the daily ridership. That was going to stay fixed for every single day. That's why we didn't gather that column, for example. Because we knew that we wanted that to say as a separate column because it doesn't fit in the same thing as those other columns. I mean, we could have, but... Uh, that's if you wanted to plot the daily ridership with other things together. That would be a possibility. So now, this is different. So before Andrew said, uh, is that NA for date? Date was never missing for any of that data. But in this case, when, for example, uh, the, United King, or the United States didn't have data for 1760, it'll still have a row. Right? It'll just be NA. So, I just, so right here we're just saying, we only want data in here that actually has, has information about deaths. Okay? So that's all we're doing here, and just so in my, when I go to do something later, if I go to plot something, I'll make sure that that's actually the data we have. All right. So now it's great. We got country in one column. We got the year. Uh, it still says the character, so it didn't it didn't necessarily convert them to numbers yet. But deaths is a double. We know that's a numeric. So um, the one big thing is year is a character still, but deaths is deaths is correct. So. Now, again, you can plot. So let's let's uh, let's just get the Sweden data. Right? We can plot deaths on the y-axis, 
year on the x-axis, and data is equal to the data set we have. Now, this is, a, this is one of the reasons why we use the, the formula syntax a little bit uh, uh, rather consistently is because now, if you do it like this, where you specify the data set, it knows that these are columns in the data set. Now, one of the issues with this is, right, we'll do this lovely plot. Okay, great. Um, but what we probably want to do is convert the year is as that numeric. year, right, just so when we actually do this plot, it'll keep it as year, but in this case, uh, it's okay, every single year, every single year is actually represented here, but this is different, right, so it just thinks of these as labels, right, so if, for example, we had one person, uh, if we had, let's see, let's take out all the data from 1800, okay, Uh, one eight. Uh, year. Oh, I already changed this numeric. So let's let's read it back in. So I'm gonna read it in from the long data set, where year is still a character. It's still just a word. So I'm gonna say sweet. Or I'm just gonna make a new data set. S is where sweet long, and I'm going to filter it by uh, Gripple. Sorry, I'm not using the string R versions. This is just for quickness. Year. Right? Anything from 1800 is gone. So now if I say plot deaths by year, data equals S. We could, do, we could do something like that, but all I'm saying is sometimes when it is a character, you want to be, you want to be careful in convert, into not keeping real numbers as characters, because sometimes it can have unintended consequences. Because it could have not been one of those words. Those characters were actually in there. Or yeah. And then it would have been split splice. Into yes. Character. All right. So that, other than maybe one or two more examples, is, ba is the base R stuff I'll cover today. Again, there's some bonus slides later, but we're not going to touch them so much. And this is awful. So uh, does everyone have, can everyone see the slide deck on the computer? Does every, okay, because these look very different from this projection from on the computer because there are grid lines, this is a gray background, and that kind of stuff. So some of the things that I change might not be that visible on this screen. So just be aware. All right, so we're going to use ggplot2. So GG stands for the grammar of graphics. So again, this is one way to try to make things more consistent. So I showed you the plot function is super general. It can do a lot of different things. But then there's like a plot function. There's a bar plot function. There's a box plot function. There's a histogram function. And ggplot2 unifies this in a very consistent way um, with very consistent options. So starting out, we usually make the jump from plot to qplot. Qplot is a ggplot2 function that stands for quick plot. Okay? Uh, it pretty much has very similar syntax to plot in the sense we say x, y, data. Right? So the x vet, we want to plot on the x axis, we want to plot the year. On the y axis, we want to plot deaths. And the data set that we're using is the Swede data set. So we only want to plot Sweden. Okay? And we see here that it plots it. By default, again, it'll, it will use points. Qplot will use points by default. Uh, but they aren't the same kind of points. Right? These are filled in, filled in points. The other one uses open circles. Right? Uh, for the most part, the plot is okay. It's not super great. The axes are very, very small still. It's hard to read. I'm generally blind from the back of the room, so I think these are way small. But you do also see that the y-axis uh, is oriented a little bit differently. It's readable top to bottom. You don't have to necessarily turn your head. That's... Some preference for some, not the others. Um, and if you actually look on your screen, you see these black 
or sorry, this gray background with these white grid lines. All right, so Q plot is great, but we're going to also teach you the general way to make a, a, a plot, a, 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 um, a ggplot. So ggplot2 is the package. In that package, there's a function called ggplot. So the first argument of ggplot is a data frame. So if you have a matrix, if you have a vector, if you have other things, you got to get into a data frame of some sort. It only works on data frames. But the, luckily, the majority of almost all data that's analyzed it is some sort of rectangular thing that you can put, uh, or some data that you can put in a rectangular format with columns and rows. So in this case, ggplot takes in the data, and then it describes what, what is referred to as aesthetics. Right? And it uses it, uh, or a mapping is another way they describe it. And the way they do that is wrapped around the AES function, the aesthetics function. So again, ggplot2, data set, then the aesthetics. And the aesthetics can be a lot of different things, and I'll cover them on the next slide. But the simplest ones for a scatter plot, for example, are what is the x and what is the y. And again, just like dplyr, just like filter, just like the other things, ggplot2 is smart enough to understand that this doesn't mean a vector in your memory. This means a column of this data set. Okay. So the, the other nice thing about it is you can assign it. You can call, like just like another object, you can say g is this plot. It won't print it out by default if you assign it. If you don't put g equals, it will plot it out. So this is really nice because you might want to build five or six different versions of the same plot with only changing a few things here or there. Like before, we said, oh, I want to do a point plot. I want to do a line plot. Maybe I want to do both of them. This makes it very easy because then you can say, I want to add lines. I want to add points. And you can save it as a different object. And the ones with lines, I want to add a whole bunch of stuff here. But the one with points, I don't want to add all that stuff. So it actually allows you to save objects. So now, by default, ggplot compared to quickplot will not do anything. This just sets it up. This just sets up a plot. It just says, okay, I know this is on the X, I know this is on the Y. I don't know if you want points, I don't know if you want lines, and I'm not assuming anything. So the way you do that is you add geoms. And we'll talk about them in a second, but I'm going to go to the most commonly used aesthetics. So X, what do you want on the X axis? Y, what do you want on the Y axis? Color, spell whatever way you like to spell color. So, and this is different. So Again, they call it a mapping or is this aesthetic because these generally get mapped to data points. So color, you can color the points by another variable, for example. You can also globally set the color to like red if you want. So you can do that separately, but it's different the way you do it. Also, the size. So instead of PCH, right, it's just what do you want the size to be? Do you want the size to be mapped like population density or something like that. That would be an example where you map size to a variable. Fill. So um, depending on the object you put in there, so uh, for example, a histogram, the bars, you can fill them in by a different variable. Uh, so fill and color are similar, but they're not the same thing. So different, um, they mean different things for different objects, for different, um, I'll call geomes, and I'll get to that exactly in a minute. So shape. Let's say you want men to be stars and women to be squares or something like that. You can map shape to, for example, a gender variable or another variable. So again, you set these in AES, right? Always inside there if you want it mapped to a variable. If you want them set for all values, for example, I want every color to be red, you'll set them inside what's called a geom. So... Again, when we said g equals this ggplot thing, we got the setup. We don't have any points on it. We don't have any layers. We haven't added anything to the plot. It's just a blank canvas, more or less. Now. So the way we add it is we actually use the plus sign and we add geomes. So the most common ones I, I believe, the ones I use most, most commonly, geom point. I want points. So if I add, say, g plus the geom point, we just got a plot. Geom line. I don't want points, I want lines. Geom density. I want to add a density plot. So I want to do a smooth histogram of the data. Right? Histogram, geom histogram. I want to do a histogram. Smooth. So sometimes you do a scatter plot and you want to put a smoother through. Right? So you want to see what is the overall shape of this data. Right? I don't want to fit a model necessarily. I want to see the data kind of inform itself 
and say, what does it kind of look like? So for example, a low S smoother, right, which is more or less a moving window that takes averages of the points as you go along the x-axis, that's one of the smoothers that you can use. We'll get to that. So box plots, I want to make box plots, right? either the x or the y-axis, geom bar, bar plots, geom tile, I want to add little squares for the x and the y, and I want to fill them by some other variable usually, and so this is very similar to heat maps, and we'll talk about one of those. So again, G is our blank canvas. It just says this is X, this is Y. So we're going to say G points. So we're going to make a whole new plot. We're going to assign that plot to some object. We're going to say G plus. So this is different. We piped with data, but G, G plot to, you literally add things. Literally with a plus symbol. Right? So you add a point. They call it a geom or a layer. So you're actually adding the points to the canvas. Right? And so this is the syntax here. We already know what x is, what, what is the x variable, what is the y, y variable from this object. And then the only reason the only reason I put a semicolon here is in R you can end the line with a semicolon and break other other commands on one line. The literal only reason I'm doing that is so this doesn't run off the bottom of the slide. Okay, so don't worry about these putting together. But by default, if I just do this, nothing's gonna get printed. So like every other thing we had in R, right, when, the first day if we just wrote X, it'll by default print, or you can explicitly say print this plot. All right, so before moving on to flashier and funnier or better plots and that kind of stuff, does this operation make sense? We set the canvas, we set what data set we're using, we set what variables we want to plot, and then we add the geometry. So if you, so I just play with, so if you plot the G, It's just the axes, right? Just a blank canvas. It just sets that up. Um, exactly. So, yep. before you write that, we're going to go three points towards the graph. Um, you have the previous command that you define Yes. So that, so I could, I could have done the exact same thing by saying, instead of using G, saying g points equals ggplot parentheses data set comma aes so it's just allowing you to store it just like you like for example when you use x equals some complicated formula and then you say x plus y it remembers what x is and it's exactly the same thing as if you wrote the whole definition of x with a placeholder so it, it treats it simply like a variable the only difference is when you just write the letter g its print function for that type of object, for that thing, is to actually plot it. Do you have to run those three points together at the same time, or will that still work for us? So you can, as long as G is in your workspace, as long as G is in memory, it's fine. There are some weird issues when you potentially uh, delete the data set from memory. So the data set from memory. So like if you save this out to an RDA file, which again is like the R data files, Right? If you save G out and then loaded it back up, but that data set was in me wasn't in memory, then some weird stuff can happen. But for the most part, if you ran G equals this and then this line right after, you're fine. So, I don't want points, I want lines. Right? So I didn't have to copy and paste the whole command again with X's and Y and then say type equals L like I would with the base functions. I said, I already know I got X and Y fixed. I know that. I like those. I just want a line instead of a points. Be like, you know what? That's not the best way to do it. So this is a little bit, for me, a easier way to kind of explicitly say what I want to do, right? Type equals L is not necessarily that um, explicit. Geom line, geom point is a little bit more. And then building a fully layered plot is re relatively straightforward. Say, I want to add lines, and then I want to add points. Sometimes the order will matter. Because it will add layers to the plot, just like if you were putting, you know, transparencies on top of each other, right? It'll add in the order in which you give it. So if you put something like a big circle right here, and then another plot that put a big circle over here, it'll mask it out depending on how you're plotting it. So it's just saying whatever came first will be, or whatever came last will be on top. Okay. Is this clear? So, I love smoothers. Um, so what this will do 
is it, this will add a line plot, and this will add a smoother. So if you have a small number of points, generally what, you, what it does is what's called a low S smoother, which is a rather simple smoother that, again, takes a window, takes all these points, takes the average, moves the window a little bit, takes an average, moves the little, and so on and so forth. By default, however, um, in GM Smooth, and we're going to look at the help file in a second, it plots these, it's, yeah, no, you can see it, so these gray lines around it, which are standard error bars, which are not always appropriate for the data that you have. So if you say GM Smooth, it also has options. And again, mapping, wherever it says mapping, whatever you assign to this, it has to have an <laughs> AES wrapped around it. But there's a whole bunch of stuff here saying like the data, the stat is a smooth position identity. More or less, a lot of this stuff you may not have to change around, but the SE equals true. Do you want to plot that standard error around it? Most of the time, I set that to equal to false. So if I go back up here, let's get wherever. Let's clear this out. And if you're running it interactively, GM smooth using method equals low S. When you start to get a lot, a lot of data, like thousands and thousands of points, it will do different smoothers for speed. Because taking that average over and over again, and I'll, I'll, I'll put that code back up in a second, but this, you see, doesn't have those gray lines there that say that's the standard error, and all you have to do is set, set that argument as equals to false. So they're not, they're just the function still. So you can look up the arguments, change the arguments as you want, just they do have this weird added layer of this aesthetic mapping. So this is a byproduct of certain types of smoothers where it's edge effects. So I mean, uh, it's that will happen with these type of smoothers and also um, other types of smoothers that have some sort of polynomial. But more or less, it, it does some weighting, and the points get weighted. So. Good general so statistical like, thing. So it's like a polynomial to the data. Not exactly, but um, you can. It's doing local regression, and so it does try to think about where the extrapolation afterwards. So that's usually not there. So generally, when you're using smoothers, two things: the ends usually aren't very reliable, but they're, and they're also usually not very reliable because usually at the ends of the data, the tails, there are less data to actually measure. Just when it's fairly reliable on the left, because there's a lot of data. Yeah. Yes, because um, the, the standard error, actually, when we do plot this, we see, do see it's getting wider. Um, and that is because we might not have good projections, for example, for every country. right? So this, so this standard error tries to give you a rough estimate as to how much data is there. Um, it's not exactly that, but um, it is somewhat proportional in some way. Right? It's proportional to the actual variability of this data, but also to how many points there. So if you have fewer points, then... Um, yeah, it's going to be more variable. Okay, so uh, I'm going to run through some of these a little bit quicker. Uh, so again, we're going to filter the data set. This should be bread and butter right now. We filtered just on a few countries. All right, sorry this got cut off. So I'm going to make a new data set, G. I'm going to reassign G, so the G I had before is gone. All right, just like I reassigned something else. Doesn't care about death data, doesn't care about Sweden, none of that stuff. So we're going to plot with this data set. I want to X is year, Y is death. But now we have multiple countries. If we don't do this, it's going to try to plot all the data together. Now we're going to map the color to the country. And I say, oh, this just set up the canvas. I want to add lines. So we get a different line for uh, Afghanistan, one for Rwanda, one for Sweden, one for UK, one for the United States. Also, you should note that some of the countries, you know, they don't start at the same time. So the axis is fixed. It gives a default set of colors that will show you how to change a little bit later. But it also puts this, this legend here. The reason I didn't do every single country is because pretty much the legend is bigger than the entire plot because it has to map every single country. And then sometimes you don't really care or you don't want that legend there, and we'll talk about how to change that. So let's go back. So I said, so guides. So they're not technically, they, they refer to them as guides. Um, so it is kind of a different terminology, but like literally there was a book called The Grammar of Graphics that some, somebody wrote. And then someone read that book and was like, that makes all the sense in the world. I'm going to write a package that follows all these rules. So these are aesthetics. These are mappings. These are canvases. These are guides. So they used literally all the words, all the verbs of this book 
and wrote an entire package that held all that um, terminology. So now, because I set color to country, I can say the guides, so guides generally refer to legends, I can say color equals false. If I said fill equals false, I would still have the legend for color. It doesn't matter. If I had set it to a different variable, so this has to match which legend you want to get rid of. Okay, so now I just want to see the overall plot with some of them. Um, but that's not necessarily great because I don't know which country is which. Sometimes this is okay. So, do some box plots. So again, I'm not assigning G, I'm just calling it on the fly, GG plot. So I said, X is year, or X is year, Y is deaths. I want to do a box plot, right? Uh, it's not so great. It doesn't exactly do what you want, right? So, uh, that depends on someone of the aesthetics, some and also how year is encoded, how year is mapped. So we don't want this. We actually want a box plot for each year as a separate category, right? So the way you can do that is you can make it into a factor, right? Like we talked about the other day. If you want to group things together, these are just years. These are numerics. But we want them treated separately. We don't want them to com combine together. So we say X is a is year, and we want to factor it. Every single year is going to have its own lovely box plot, and then we add the box plot. So I don't know if this is a good or bad graphic. It depends on what you're trying to see. But for example, if we're looking at the median, we overall see that the median child mortality goes down. Um, we see the data back here is highly variable, and actually the data we have from this data set have much lower uh, child mortality. So probably they are, they are the countries which much, with much longer bookkeeping, and so if you're just looking at the data back here, you're probably getting some bias compared to the rest of the countries. Is this clear? This command. Great. All right. So, geom jitter. So sometimes you don't want to plot points because if you plot points via categories based on certain categories, they plot one on top of each other. That's not great. Sometimes you want to jitter them up so you can see the spread. So now I'm just subsetting a few set of years, 95 to 2000, 2000 inclusive. Right, so I'm saying these five countries, right, so I'm still, or sorry, these are all the countries, right, so I'm still using all the data set, I want to do a box plot for each year, and so I'm saying, all right, put in this data set, I want to factor a year, so I want a separate box plot for a year, Y is deaths, geom box plot, outlier shapes, so normally, box and whisker plots, you put, you put the max, the min, as whiskers, 75th, 25th percentile as lines, the median as a line, and a box around it. And if you have outliers, you put them as points. If the max or the min or something, you know, so there are rules, right? So if the median plus 1.5 times the width of the box, that's called an outlier, just by the default from Tukey from like 70 years ago. That's what, that's this general rule that we've kept as tradition and whatever. Um, but I'm already going to plot the points later, so I don't need you to plot the outlier points for me in, in box plot, which it will do by default. Okay, so it'll automatically plot the outliers, like it did in this plot. Right, you see points down here. These are outliers. I don't need you to plot them. I'm going to plot my own points. All right? Get off me. So if outlier shape, you can call that NA. So just say missing. I don't want it to put anything. There is no shape for those. Delete them. And then I'm going to add GM jitter. So I want to add points, but I want them jittered. Right? I want them moved around a, li a little bit from their spots. Right? But I don't want them to jitter on the y-axis. I don't need you to move them up and down. Up and down is fine. I need you to move them left and right. So I want to set the height of the jitter to zero. So I don't want you to move them up and down. Width will be will be set by default. And I'll say, okay, we'll move it around. So this gives you an idea of the box plot also with the data. Now, if I switch these up, right, you're going to see the full box plot here. All those points there are going to be masked out because of the order in which we did it. Okay? Yes. So let's. No, you can do that, but you can do that, but that takes a little bit more code. So sometimes maybe that's what you want, right? So you can make transparencies, but for the most part, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get. We'll, I think we'll get to that. So now we can color stuff. Now we can map stuff to aesthetics. Sometimes we want to plot it over different panels or different facets of the data. So instead of plotting each one of these as a separate color, right? So we just got same stuff here, sub, pipe it in here, geom line, everything up here should be 
bread and butter right now with respect to ggplot2. The only thing we're adding is facets. So you add a facet underscore wrap, and the syntax is a little different. You want, so it's the tilde, it's this formula syntax, and I want to do it over country. Okay. So I want a different facet by country. So now we see Afghanistan, Rwanda, Sweden, United Kingdom, U.S. as different panels. So for example, if you wanted to plot something by ID, blood pressure over time, you would show a different panel for each individual person. Sometimes you don't want them mapped like that. So you, there are other options in the facet wrap function that says, I only want one column. I want you to line them up vertically. So note, all these axes are, are exactly the same, right? You can change that, but generally you don't because you want things apples to apples. You want to be able to compare this one. The point of, of facets is to be able to compare things across or compare things down. And in this case, I don't necessarily want to compare things across because I don't want to see maybe that maybe that relationship. I want to see what the trends are over time, and I want the, I want the y-axis, the years, to line up. What's the end column? Number of columns equals one. So you see there's only one column of, of plots. Okay, uh, this is an actual plot, but I'm just saying if you wanted more than one facet, so you can do by, so let's say the countries were grouped by like area, of, let's say a continent, for example, you can add more things in the facets to do different types of paneling, different types of faceting. So you can say, you could do it by, you know, continent and then by country or something like that, which would facet them out a little bit differently. And it doesn't have to have one line per facet. So if we had continent and just used tilde continent, we would have all the lines for the countries in that continent. And we should and we should probably also color them differently. So we would app map color to country, for example. Alright, so let's let's make things better. Right? So they're small. Um, that's generally good for uh, longitudinal or sorry, for exploratory data. Not necessarily that great when you're trying to make plots for collaborator or people want colors or titles or whatever. So X lab, Y lab, they're the same things as, as in regular plot, but these are now functions that you add. So we have this fun thing, Y. Right, I'm gonna beat this, beat this down over and over again. We're using qplot here just for a short shorthand. You could have used I you normally use ggplot, but again, qplot. You just say year, deaths, color, data, and then you specify the genome in this way in qplot. Again, by default, it's in points, but if you want to change the geometry around, you just say geome equals. This is you could have also taken this out and said plus geome line. Okay, now you add in the x lab, right? So that's a function. We're saying the x labels this, the y labels this, gg title. There is a title function in R. That's why it's not called title. GG title, I want to change the title to this and the subtitle to that. Okay? So X lab, Y lab, GG title. So, um, some people don't like the, the defaults in ggplot2, so there are a large, I would say a decently large set of themes, right, that control the more or less the global aspects of the plot. So, like, is there a black background? Is there a white background? How big, are the, how big are the lines? How big are the axes? How big are the titles? Right? And so these themes, um, if, you look, if you look up theme underscore BW, theme underscore black white, then you see uh, all the types of different ggplot2 themes. Some of them are specific, for example, to journal, like The Economist, that kind of stuff. Um, so there are different themes for different uh, scenarios. You can find one you like and use that. And all you have to do is say plus the theme and it'll change everything. So again, it's not easy to see, but there are different, it's, the background is different here. It's black and white. It's not having a gray background. Okay? That changes whatever, that is, ch that changes whatever elements that theme had to happen to change. Yes. I believe, generally though, the theme is about the canvas and the axes, not necessarily about coloring the plots because you set that usually in the, in the aesthetics. So theme itself is a way to change those things in a way that you want. So you say, oh, I like the black and white theme for this, this, and this, but I actually don't like this element, that element. I want to change those specifically. So theme is a general uh, 
it's a general way to just change the things within your ggplot. So um, it is a little bit confusing uh, how to use it, but one, uh, some of the things I'll show you, three or four examples of the things I almost always change. One of them is text size. Text is too small. Text is too small. Text is too small. Assume someone can't, can't read from the back of your room and all your slides are big. So, um, and then you'll go to the back of the room and be like, I can't read your slides. Um, but, so this, the way we set this, we can set the overall text, and I want to say it's an element of text, and I want to say the size is 12. I want to change the text size. And the title, I want to change that. So the title is much bigger, everything else. So the axes, for example, some of these things stay around 12, but the, the titles... So not just the main title, all the titles increase in size. And I'll go over the help file a little bit there uh, in a minute. So also, we can change every single aspect of every single axis, text, size, or whatever that we want. We can make this blue, we can do whatever. So here's an example. Axis.text, so the axes, we want them at 14. Point. Titles, we want them at 20. Axis titles... So these two, the axis titles, not the overall global title, not the title of the plot. Specifically, if we didn't set this, the axis titles would default to 20. Because this is like, just all titles. This is like, no, I just want this axis title to be 16. Change just these. Keep that 20. You're good. And then I want to change where the legend is. I am uh, of the camp that legend should be within the plot. Um, and so uh, I moved it, and it's a relative set of axes, so x and y, you, you specify the position by the x coordinate and the y coordinate relative to, 100, to 0 to 100%, 0 to 100%. Okay, so that's why it's 0 0.9, so it's going to go 0.9 to the right and go up 0 0.8 and then start the legend there. Okay? And before, just I'm going to jump back one second. I didn't like that little c. That little c was because the variable's name's uh, country. That's actually a nice variable name. But when it's like C underscore more underscore tality underscore five, that's not, it's generally not that pretty. So I want to reset the title name, uh, the title of the legend to something a little bit different. So cookbook R, or R cookbook, I forget which one it is, is fantastic. It has hundreds of examples of how to, you say, I want to change this in ggplot2. And like the first thing is like, you say to change it in ggplot2. Um, okay. Okay. Q? I get the... This line? Yeah. No, so, no, sorry. This. Right yeah. So this is just printing it, but this is saying for the legends. Yeah. So the color legend, the legend for color. So in this case, color is mapped to country. So I want to change something about the title of it. Uh, okay. So I want to change the title to be a capital C for country. Okay. So one I actually use a lot, this is something I wrote, uh... You don't necessarily have to know exactly what it does, but more or less, it makes a transparent legend. So it says the background is transparent, the keys background are transparent, and then I just add this to plot. So you can actually see the data if there is any in the background. It makes it translucent. Whereas here, if you actually look here, it's, it's hard, again, impossible to see on this projector, but there is a big white box around here, and each one of these has a specific white box around it. Um, so that just changes both of those boxes to be fully transparent so that I, you can see anything in the background if there was data. Okay. All right, histograms. Again, we talked about hist. You can change the breaks of them if you want to see them more uh, elucidated out. Right. So again, it's base R, so you have to do, you know, usually... You know, some referencing, you have to pass it a vector. You can't use the, the it doesn't know which data set you're looking from. So let's, so let's look at, so, sorry, right here, we're looking at just a histogram of all deaths over all time for all countries. Or actually, for those four countries that we, five countries that we subsetted. Okay? So we can do histograms again. So genome equals histogram. We're again using Qplot. Uh, and we're filling it. So color has a different connotation for a histogram. It is not the same thing that you think. It's actually the color of the outlines of the boxes. That's generally not what you want to change. You want to change what color is filled in. And so now we can say, okay, I want factor of the country. Um, I don't believe we actually had to factor it because country specifically was a character. But 
Um, so it's a quick plot. We want to do the histogram, and this is looking at over all years for each one of them the density of the number of deaths. Okay, actually the counts. So Why don't you put the C around histogram? You you don't. Uh, so when, if, if it's just one single, so if you want to do multiple ge geometries, you'd say C line comma points comma whatever. So you can actually do multiple one of them, multiple geomes in qplot by just saying passing a vector rather than a single uh, geome and when it's just when it's just one thing you don't have to put C around so uh, sometimes you know they're overplotted on each other and it doesn't always look so good if you have a lot of overplotting you want to use well, what's called alpha blending or opacity so uh, that is just another one of the arguments um, where you say alpha equals 0.7 so alpha equals 0.7, saying I want everything to have, you know, 70% translucence. You could also, again, map alpha to a variable. So you're saying, like, if things are really, 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 like, if a large population, they're really dark. Otherwise, if it's a small population, it might be lighter or more translucent. So similarly with histograms, we're doing the same thing. We're doing densities, right? So densities are scaled a little bit differently, but again, the x is on the deaths are on the x-axis. Some measure of the distributions on the y-axis, and we're doing it over country. Same exact code. The only difference is we said alpha equals the 0.7. This is kind of a byproduct that we don't necessarily like. Uh, there are ways to get around that, but I'm not going to talk about those right now. But it's saying I want them to be 70% opaque, so we can actually see the distributions behind each other. Otherwise, they'd just be all pl plotted on top of each other. Okay. Another way to do that is if we set the aesthetic to color rather than fill. So before we said fill equals country. Here we say color equals country. So it just colors the lines correspondingly to each separate country versus filling them all in. And that might be an easier way to do it. Uh, I kind of hate these. I, hate the, I, hate, I don't hate these plots specifically, but I hate that they have these connecting lines at the bottom. Uh, that just annoys me. Uh, so there are ways to get around that. So you say the same thing that we had before, the color, the data, and you actually say, I want lines, but the statistic that we're doing is not, don't plot the data, plot the density. So again, you don't have to know exactly what's going on here for the most part, but if you ever want to say, how do you get rid of those lines, this is the way to do it. Okay, so this is the exact same plot, just without the connectors at the bottom, right, as I flip back and forth. Except we actually did some alpha blending. We did set alpha here, but that's not as relevant because you're not having so much overplotting. All right, so spaghetti plots. Here's a terrible one, right? Um, so this is plotting all the countries separated by different colors for the mortality over time shown by lines. And again, if I don't put this here, it's going to be literally just a huge legend that just says like, UK is green, US is blue, so on and so forth. Um, so we probably definitely want to put some alpha blending on here. But this is kind of, this is one way to show a spaghetti plot is if you color it by, by a factor, and then it'll plot each one each line by that factor. So uh, sometimes if you if you're also doing uh, a whole lot of longitudinal data, for example, you want to do tiles, so or heat maps, for example. So here we still have time on the x-axis. We have different countries on the y-axis now, and each one of these little rectangles is filled in by some measure of child mortality. Okay, So you can see Sweden, the UK, the US have generally low. These have a lot higher from, 95, from 1990 to 2005. And again, similarly like uh, uh, the regular plot function, you can use xlim, but it is a function now versus an argument in the function. Okay? So sometimes we don't like the colors that are defaulted, so there are a whole different way, a whole set of ways to do that. Um, in this case, I want to say I want to scale the scale, right? So the scale for the, for the fill, I want to map it. So the way deaths is mapped in, I want to actually use a gradient. That goes low is blue, uh, high is red, 
right? Before it uses whatever the default was, which pretty much is black is low, light blue is high. So we can change that. Again, we're just adding to the last slide so everything before was already run. So we're saying, I want to fill for the fill aesthetic. I want to scale that. I want to change the scale, the scaling on the color bar, and I want to use a gradient from low to high, from blue to red. And there are ways to change the brakes? There are ways to change the brakes as well in, the, in that function. So you can do that, or you can make your own brakes. So this is one way we did it. So we're using the cut function like we did before. We said, all right, I want to, I want to cut deaths. I want to say from 0, 1, 2, and then the max. All right, so now we're making a factor. So now, Q plot, we're saying again the year, y is, uh, X is the year, Y is the country. Fill is now this category, this categorical um, to, or discrete variable that we're using, right? It's not continuous anymore from zero to the maximum. It's now cut into different factors, and the data is still the sub. We want to do tile, color equals false. And now the colors correspond to the categories. Okay, so we see again, for the most part, uh, the category, so the coloring is maybe not so great um, in some respects because zero to one, super, uh, really really low child mortality is in red, uh, a little bit higher is in green, and then the really low is in, or the really high is in blue, and you're going to change those orders around using the scale underscore fill underscore. Uh, it's discrete now because we're mapping a discrete uh, variable. So lastly, uh, I'm going to talk about bar charts, bar plots. Um, again, we're going to read some Kaggle car auction data. We have two variables that we're kind of interested in. Is it a bad buy? Is the car a bad buy? So if somebody says, is it a lemon or not? And then someone said, uh, and then they find out what the cost was. So we want to see, like, is the proportion of bad cars relevant to the, the cost? So if you buy an expensive car, are you less prone to maybe getting a lemon, for example? So uh, again, during the in the so the one reason I use base here is because there is a very simple way to do stack bar charts that actually normalize to one. So again, we can do the table. Sorry, we can do a table of the counts. So we do just is it a bad buy? Vehicle age. Let's give us a two-way table where the cells correspond to the counts that fall into those categories. And then we just say bar plot right on the right on the table. Right. We don't have to pass in data. We just give it this matrix of counts. It knows that this is a table and it does a bar chart uh, bar plot. Okay. So it's saying. How many, so now it's doing counts, so it's saying how many bad buys are there um, with different, um, sorry, we didn't do cost, we did age. How old is the car, my, my apologies. So it's how old is the car, so do older cars have a higher likelihood of um, being bad? Uh, we don't necessarily know, uh, but it looks like there, there is maybe some trend there. Um, I'm not going to talk about, again, some of the defaults here. We can do legends and all that kind of stuff in base, but it's kind of gone the ggplot route to at least for teaching this. So we can do a proportion table. Remember, prop that table will do proportions. Again, you put in the table and then you put the margin in which you want to do the 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 percentage of, right? So if you just don't if you don't put any margin, it just says says everything. Take all the cells, divide by the grand total, the sum of all the cells. In this case, we want to do column totals, right? One is row, two is column, and so for each individual car age. We want to look at what is the percentage of a bad buy. And in this case, we're saying, okay, if it's brand new, not many. If it's nine years old, you know, you're looking about like 30, 25 to 30% are not necessarily great buys. Um, again, this code tells you how to change the title, the labels, uh, the colors, and uh, the legend. So similarly with ggplot2, uh, because is bad buy is just a zero one variable, it doesn't see it as categorical, so we have to use it. We have to change it into a factor. And we're doing this on the fly. We could have done it with our data set previously and not run factor inside here. But here we're factoring it. We say fill is the factor, right? So we're filling it by whether it's a zero or one. X, we're just doing the vehicle age data. We're using the cars data set and GM bar. We want to do a bar plot. So the one thing is sometimes if you want to plot summaries, you have to do those summaries first before doing the plotting and making your own data frame. But the great thing is dplyr and all the functions we've showed you shows, shows how to easily summarize things. So again, I promised I told you I was going to tell you about tally, but it was cut off at the bottom of one of those slides. So I, I added that back in just so you could see it. So percentage, I'm calling perk. Cars, we're piping it into the group by. We're grouping it by bad by and vehicle age. 
right? So it's going to go over all the categories that are present in our data. And we're going to use tally, which tells us, just count. Count how many rows we got. How many, how many have a bad buy and zero, no bad buy, zero, no vehicle age, or age of zero, brand new car. There's two. How many, no bad buy, one years old, there's 2,969. So tally will be a shortcut for summarizing the data by the count. Okay? So now, we have that in counts, but we want it in percentages to do this stacking. Right? So, we're going to make a new data set perk, and we're going to pipe it in. We're going to group it by vehicle age, and we're going to uh, mutate and say N is divided by the sum. So every single, every single vehicle age separately is going to say how many bad buys, how many not bad buys, and do the numbers divided by the total. Right? So it gives us a percentage of bad buys for each year. And now we're going to, um, again, use the bad buy filtering. Is it a bad buy, yes or no? Y, or sorry, X is the vehicle age. Y is now the percentage. And we're using this, this data, the, the percentage is bad. But now the difference is we don't want you to try to summarize. We don't want you to do counts. We just want to say we've already summarized the data. Just use it as is. So that's what stat equals identity means. Use just the data I've provided. And you can see there's an increasing percentage. And again, if we look here, it's around maybe 35%. All right, some useful links. There's a lot out there. Cookbook R, I think, is really good. Um, we ran through a whole slew of slides, a whole slew of different plots. But I would say in your day-to-day, -day, these are the majority of the ones you want to do. So some sort of scatter plot, some sort of panels. So are there any plots that you say, I have no idea how to do this in R. I really want to do this kind of plot. Pie charts? No. <laughs> End of story. We're not doing, no. They are bad plots, period. People do not understand area very well, and therefore they do not understand pie charts very well. So if you put an exploding pie chart in any of your slides, other than maybe for hyperbole, please do not put this class on your CV. <laughs> this class on your CV, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, a lot of other things. Like bar, like bar charts aren't that bad, but anyway. So um, there's some plots here. Again, if you want to go through the other slides, they show how to do some of these things in base, um, but we're not going to go over that. How do you, so if you're putting a two running of code, right, you're putting out a whole bunch of different plots. Yep. How do you save and go back? Grab oh, them? yes. That actually is in those slides. Sorry. I, I think I cut it off too soon. You are correct. So there are things. So in general, it's called a device. The lovely thing is if you're using Markdown and Knitter, it saves them for you, but that's not the way you always want to save it. There. Okay. Just like paste yeah. it every time um, sometimes it will save it if you wanted to. So okay, great question. So there's a bunch of devices. So PNG, PDF, JPEG, uh, SVG, EPS, a lot of other ones, right, that actually exist in R. Generally the ones I do are PNGs for single plots, PDFs for multi plots. If you are plotting a, for example, a graph with millions or billions of points, do not use a PDF because in a PDF, all those points are technically encoded in that in that PDF. So sometimes they can take minutes or break your viewer and not open up. PNGs or bitmaps or some other ones, JPEGs, are what's called rastered formats, which means it's more or less a picture. Right? It doesn't encode the data anywhere. But on the other side, if you scale a JPEG too much, it becomes very pixelated. A PDF, you can scale to as, as fine a detail as you want because the data is encoded in there. All right, so the way you do it, you say PDF or PNG or JPG or B BMP, and you say the file name. You usually always want to put the correct file name if it's PDF or PDF. Uh, you can say the height and width. You can also do resolution for PNG, um, certain things like that. If you want it in inches or pixels or that kind of stuff, there are all arguments in there. You just run the plot. You print the plot out, right? So in this case, we run the plot function. Or if you had done all this code to make this really awesome plot, then you just say, like, PDF, print the object, yep. like, G. Yep. And if it's a PDF and you run multiple ones, they'll just keep adding pages over and over and over again. Dev.off turns it off. So dev.off um, will close the device. Now, if you opened up, P if you said PDF and you said, I run all these plots, plots are great, and then it errors. 
and you do not run dev.off, it still has that device open. You'll start trying to plot interactively. Nothing will show up. You won't know why. Usually that's because there's an open device somewhere else or you forgot to close it or there's an error in that code. You say dev.off and it'll close that. Also, if you open a PDF and you start putting out plots and you do not do dev.off, you cannot open it. Okay? It's just, it's still an open device. It's not closed it to like the ending the PDF assumes to see. So if you try to open a, um, if you try to open that actual file, it won't let you do it. Um, again, that, that's pretty much at the bottom. So, sorry, I will, so if you say P it, question PNG, so bitmap, JPEG, PNG, TIFFs, a lot of journals require high-res TIFFs, bless you. Um, so you can also set height. I usually, a lot of times, for example, set height and width with respect to inches. It, by default, it's set to picks. So for example, I say seven, seven units is inches. Res, I would change to three to 600 for a publication journal, right? Three to 600 uh, PPI that they require. Similarly with TIFFs. Um, and then I would make my plot and then I would uh, say dev.off. Great question. Uh, I've totally, I, we, I didn't copy correctly. So, all right. So let's take five minutes to look at the plotting lab. Um, but before we do that, so any last questions? Because that was a great one and a huge one. Um, there are other things like geom text. For example, if you want to add text to a plot, this is also very important, uh, very relevant. If you make multi-panel figure or a multiple multi-panel figure for a journal, for example, you want to put A in the bottom, panel A, B in the bottom, for example. Um, yeah. Are there packages that you can read to do that? GGplot2 or PDF? No, PDF. No, PDF comes with base. So if you say PDF. Do you put, uh, sorry, so do you, you put PDF and you put a file name. So, awesome plot dot PDF. And then you did, let's say, let's copy one of these. Uh, let's plot, let's copy the, no, oh, we're, uh, sub year. There we go. Okay, let's, uh, GM jitter. Where was that code? So if I run this, dev dot off, you, you close the device. And then you try. You look for awesome not plot not PDF. Uh. So do it again. Uh, do it again. Like close. Do dev dot off a few times until it says you're out of yeah. devices, and then run it again, and then see if it opens. So uh, usually, again, that's because of an open device or something like that. So now we got this on our hard disk as a PDF. All right. So let's open the lab. Maybe do about five minutes of that. Uh, I will post. Uh, I'll post this on. So. Is that is that relevant to people? Do you want me like make a YouTube? Okay, I'll just post this online. Everybody's okay with that. All right.